Hello everyone. My name is Vafid Bandi Murad. I'm a PhD student in mechanical and aerospace engineering at Cornell University. And today I'm going to talk about the classification of stars, galaxies, and quasars using photometric and spectroscopic measurements of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS. This presentation is given as the final project of the class Astro 6523, Modeling, Mining, and Machine Learning in Astronomy. I will start by giving a short introduction about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS. So SDSS is a multi-spectral imaging and spectroscopic redshift survey. It uses a 2.5 meter wide angle optical telescope located at the Apache Point Observatory in Southeast New Mexico in the United States. It started working in the year 2000. And over the past 20 years, it has led to many scientific discoveries such as the production of high precision maps of cosmic expansion history and the discovery of new celestial objects like brown dwarfs and distant quasars. I have taken this picture using the SDSS online navigation tool, and there are different objects that can be seen in this picture. So we can see some galaxies, some stars, and even one quasar. So to give a brief introduction, about quasars. So a quasar is the short form for quasi-stellar radio source. It is an extremely luminous active galactic nucleus, and it is located billions of light years away. It is a very important object in space because it plays an important role. So it serves as a beacon in cosmology. It helps us in mapping the distribution of galaxies in the universe and it provides insights into the early universe conditions. And in order to take these pictures, the SDSS telescope uses this camera. This camera contains five different filters. So we can see in the left a diagram of these filters. Each different color represents a different filter. And here in the middle, we have a real photograph of the, of the camera of the telescope. And here on the right, we have the representation of the different filters uh, versus the wavelength in angstroms. So we have the U, G, R, I, and Z filters. They correspond to the ultraviolet, green, red, near infrared, and the infrared filters. Two of them correspond to the visible light range, and the three others are in the invisible range. However, these measurements are not enough to distinguish between different objects. As we can see here, uh, on the left, we have a star in the Milky Way, and on the right, we have a very distant quasar. However, when we see them using photometric measurements, they look very similar. So we cannot tell apart stars from quasars solely uh, based on uh, photometric measurements. So we need a second type of measurement which is the spectroscopic measurement. So on the bottom, we have the spectro spectrographs of stars and quasars. So the signature of stars are these different dips or valleys that we can see in this plot, whereas the signature of quasars are these different peaks that we can see in the picture. So in order to classify stars, quasars, and galaxies, we will use two types of data. We will use photometric data and spectroscopic data. And here is how our data looks like. So we have a column that represents the object ID. Then we have five columns that represent the values of the different filters, U, G, R, I, and Z. And we have the redshift value. And finally, we have the column that represents the class of the object. The SDSS contains hundreds of millions of data. However, for the sake of this project, we will use a subset of 100,000 data. And in addition to these different values, we also have the values of the right ascension and the declination of the objects. However, these two values will not be used in the classification. They will only be used to plot the location of the bodies in space. So here is the celestial representation of the different bodies in space. 
So we have galaxies in red, stars in blue, and quasars in green. And we can notice that most objects or all the objects here are located in the north part of the sky. And this is because the SDSS telescope is located in New Mexico, in the United States, in the North Hemisphere. So it can only map the north part of the sky. And to address this problem, the SDSS also uses a second telescope located in the other side of the planet, particularly in Chile. And the name of the, this telescope is called du DuPont Telescope. And it's been used since 2017. However, for the sake of this presentation and this work, we will be only focusing on these data located in the north part. So in my work, I started by doing some feature selection of the data. So here is the correlation matrix. And we can see that there is a very high correlation between different features in the photometric data. So I imposed a threshold of 0 0.95. And we see here that the filters, the red filter, the near infrared and the infrared filters are very correlated. So we can get rid, we can get rid of two of them. In this case, we get rid of the near infrared filter and the infrared filter. So we end up with uh, three different filters plus the redshift. So we have four values and based on these four values, we will do our classification. We also have to deal with the unbalanced data. In this case, we have a data set of 100,000 points. 55% of them are galaxies, about 19% are quasars, and about 22% are stars. So to deal with this issue, we will use an algorithm called SMOOT, which stands for Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique. So imagine that you have a majority class that consists of blue crosses and a minority class that consists of red circles. So the smooth algorithm uh, computes the k nearest neighbors of a given point in the minority class and it relies the different points together and then it creates synthetic data points between the, the, the real points actually. And the number of synthetic points depend on how many numbers do we really need. So in my case, I started by scaling the data first, and then I split the data into 80% for training and 20% for testing. And then I applied the smooth algorithm. And here is the uh, final number of my training set. So we have about 47,000 uh, points for each class. And for the classification, the first algorithm that I used is the support vector machine, SVM. And the goal of the SVM is to find the separating hyperplane that separates the data, but also at the same time uh, maximizes the distance between the hyperplane and the point. So we want this width of the street to be as wide as possible. However, sometimes the data is not linearly separable, so we can get some uh, red squares in this blue region, and, and we can also get some blue circles in this uh, red region. So in this case, we add an additional term, which is this one, in order, in order to allow the algorithm to accept some misclassified point. So we have this quantity, this constancy. So if C is very large, then the width is very small. Uh, inversely, if C is very small, then the width is very large. Also, if the data has this form and it is not linearly separable, we can use something called the kernels. And the goal of the kernels is to take the data from the small d dimension to the capital D dimension, which is larger than small d. And the data could be not linearly separable in the, this dimension, and then when we uh, increase the dimension, the data uh, becomes separable, as we see in these two pictures here. And there are different ways to use kernels. We have mainly three different kernels that we use generally. We have the linear, linear kernel, the RBF, also called the Gaussian kernel, 
and we also have the polynomial kernel. So I did a grid search. So I varied the value of C. I chose three different values. I also chose three different kernels. And I also changed the, the degree. And the degree here corresponds to the degree of the polynomial in this case, or the value of sigma in the case of the RBF. So we have three by three by three equals to 27 models. And in order to select the best model out of these 27 models, we use a threefold cross validation. So we train our models in fold two and three and test them in fold one. Then we train them in fold one and three and test them in fold two. And then we train them in fold one and two and test them in fold three. And then we take the mean and choose the best model. In this case, we have 27 models that are trained three times. So we have 81 trainings and testings. And this whole operation takes about three hours and 30 minutes, which is very long. And the best model at the end is the model that has C equals to 10, degree equal to two, and kernel LBF. And then we take this best model and train it again, but this time on the whole training set. So we take this model and training on fold one, two, and three, and then we get our final a fit. And when we test our model in the test set, so we get the accuracy of 0 0.94, which is very a very good result, actually. And here is our confusion matrix. We have the true class in the y-axis and the predicted class in the x-axis. And we can see that galaxies have been predicted with an accuracy of 91%. Quasars have been predicted with an accuracy of 100%. And stars have been predicted with an accuracy of 96%. And this is just another representation of the results. This is the number of predicted class versus the actual class. And the reason why we have very high values for quasars is that quasars are very distinguishable from stars and galaxies based on the redshift physically. The second, the second model that we use is random forest. So the three parameters that we vary in this case are the number of estimators, which is the number of trees used in the forest, the maximum depth, which is the depth that the tree can reach. We also have this value known. In this case, we don't have any restriction on the maximum depth. Then we have the minimum sample split. Uh, so if, for example, we have a given number of points in a given sample. We, if this number is smaller than, let's say, 10 in this case, then the split will not happen. So the condition for the split to happen is to have a number of points in a given sample equal or larger than the minimum sample split. So here again, we have 20, 27 different models. We test them in a three-fold cross validation. We select the best model. And in this case, the whole operation only took four minutes, which is much faster compared to the SVM. And the best model in this case is this one. So the maximum depth is known. So we don't have any restrictions on the maximum depth. The minimum sample split is two and the number of estimators is 50. So, and then we train it again on the whole training set. And the test accuracy in this case is 0 0.823, which is smaller than the accuracy of the SVM. And here's the confusion matrix. In this case, the galaxies have been predicted with an accuracy of 81%. The quasars have been predicted with an accuracy of 98%. And stars have been predicted with an accuracy of 97%. And here is the importance plot. So this plot shows the importance of each feature uh, that has been used in the random forest. So we can see here that the redshift is the most important feature in our training set. And this is predictable actually, because if we recall our two images earlier, we had stars and quasars and we cannot distinguished stars from quasars based on photometric data, U, R, G, I, and Z. So in this case, this is a confirmation that the redshift is 
actually the most important feature. And finally, I wanted to test the sensitivity of the event of forested noise. So even if our initial uh, signal already contained noise, but I wanted to add some noise to it. So here we have the uh, signal to noise ratio in the X axis, and we have the accuracy of the random forest in the Y axis. And we can see an increase in the accuracy uh, with an increasing signal to noise ratio. And this values converge to 0 0.8, which is approximately the accuracy without any noise. Finally, here are some conclusions. Uh, the SVM is about 50 times slower, but 12% more accurate than the random forest. Uh, second, we could potentially increase the number of estimators, which is the number of trees used in the random forest, to see if we can increase the accuracy while still preserving the speed. Uh, the third point is that the redshift is the most important feature to classify the data sets. And finally, we have seen that the influence of the noise on the accuracy of the random forest becomes negligible at about uh, a signal to noise ratio equals to 15. Thank you for your attention.